Hello and good afternoon, everybody. My name's Sam and I'm the Marketing Manager at Open Reality and I'll be hosting the session today. Uh, our webinar is in collaboration with Droplet Computing and today we're going to be looking at how Droplet containers can help the NHS to secure vulnerable legacy applications and achieve Cyber Essentials Plus. Before I hand over to my colleague Dave, I'd just like to remind you that all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. So if you do have a question at any point, please use the Q&A pane on the left hand side and we'll do our best to answer the questions at the end. The session is being recorded, so you'll get a link to the recording following the webinar today. OK, uh, without further ado, Dave, take it away. Thanks, Sam. Um, just thought I'd just spend two minutes with two slides just going over an introduction into open reality. Um, looking at the attendee list, some of you guys are, are well-known customers with us for a long time and some of you um, are not. So I thought it was worth maybe just doing a little introduction just so you get a bit of background on open reality and also a bit of context as to why we're working with Droplet and how it fits into our portfolio. So just a bit of background on open reality, um, founded back in 1999 with one product, which was a packet level analyzer. And a lot of our customers still to this day know us as network performance specialists. Over time, that's grown and we've kind of taken different areas with security, cloud and wireless being quite big parts of our business. I'll kind of go into a bit more detail on those on, on the following slide. We have quite a lot of success within the NHS and public sector, and we've had quite a few large recent projects varying across a wide portfolio that we offer around network performance, some Microsoft professional services, and some Palo Alto installations from a next-gen firewall perspective. If you go to the next slide, Barry. Thanks. So, Open Reality's core portfolio mainly focuses around niche products, so not everyday products that you would see. So from a network monitoring perspective, we work with around 10 different vendors from the likes of PRTG, SolarWinds, VRV. Wireless is quite a big part of Open Reality now, and we've got a distribution arm of the business, um, and they distribute products uh, like wireless site surveys from the market leader, Ekehow, wireless monitoring, and some access point vendors as well. Droplet quite nicely fits into, I suppose, both IT security and end user computing, which I suppose we're going to be focusing on today. From an IT security perspective, we also work with Palo Alto for firewalls um, and Sentinet and um, some other mail and web filtering products. We have a consultancy business um, as well that focus mainly around Microsoft, Citrix, VMware, um, and we also offer managed services around a lot of those products as well. And from an end user computing perspective, um, Droplet fits quite nicely into that area, but we also work with the likes of Citrix, VMware, and Microsoft now with their Azure as a service. Um, that's pretty much a snapshot of what Open Reality do. Um, like I said, we mainly work with kind of niche products, Droplet being, I think, a fantastic product, which is quite new to our portfolio. And with the success that they've had within NHS, we thought it'd be wise to do a demo today, focusing on our NHS customers just basically giving them information about the products and hopefully help, hopefully informing you about how we can help you. So yeah, that's a brief demo and a brief, sorry, a brief introduction to Open Reality. I'll pass over to Barry and Michelle to talk, talk further about Droplet and do a demo. Hi guys, um, Barry Daniels here, the COO and founding investor of Droplet Computing. Um, ready to give you an introduction today on what our container technology has been able to achieve within the NHS and how we're able to really sell three things, security, compatibility, and compliance is where we sit. Um, I'd like to first say we're a container technology, but we're not Docker. We don't have Docker in our, our stack at all. Um, in fact, it's worldwide patented, completely new, different way of doing things. And we're about isolating the applications that you run away from the underlying operating system, wrapping them up into a security bubble, and allowing them the freedom to exist where they need to, to run. So they're very portable, compatible across multiple operating systems. And it's ideal because of its security for those legacy applications, really to protect some of the issues that, that have been faced uh, traditionally within NHS. And this, this talks really to the, to the problem within NHS. The, the biggest challenge you have is it's unlike any other industry in many, many ways, because patient records have to exist for 
many decades. It's not just a, a one-hit show of uh, seven years compliance and then you can destroy information. And therefore, the complexities around maintaining older systems are, are far more challenging than in any other industry. And with that, that comes the, the challenge of how do I secure it? It's all fine and well keeping these going. There were things like the WannaCry ransomware virus. There was things along the lines of what happened within healthcare within Ireland in this last few weeks and lots of zero day attacks that have been faced from certain other governments, uh, attacks from Russia, China. And, and as I understand it, you, you've all on a, a journey to, to try and pass this Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus, depending on what level of, of information you're dealing with. And that really needs to be completed by the end of this year. Freedom of information um, that we requested back in September of last year showed that still one in three computers in the NHS are still running Windows 7. And the main challenge around that is because of these legacy applications that still have to persist. You get some certain ISVs that hold you to ransom, and they can be extremely expensive to upgrade uh, to the new system for no real feature benefit or no real productivity benefit to the trust, other than the fact that it will run on Windows 10 and therefore be secure and therefore compliant. And, and the cycle will just continue because the different versions of Windows 10 keep coming. There's a new version on it on its way, for example, and that will break things on applications because the applications are still tied to the underlying operating systems. So even if you go down the route of, of something along the lines of packaging or application refactoring, they still have tied dependency to the underlying operating system. And when it comes to upgrade time, that can cause a major challenge within trusts because it's a, a major problem and a, and a headache to try and stay on the latest, greatest piece. The good, the good news is I'll talk about security in more detail a little bit later, but we take a, a not just a zero trust model, but a zero let in model um, where we can protect pretty much better than, than most other systems I've seen out there on zero day threats as well from the way we, we deal with security. Um, We've won some awards. Whoop de do in some ways, hasn't everybody? These are these are quite nice awards um, because they were by our peers of the British Computer Society, um, the Chartered Institute for IT here in the UK. Um, we have platinum sponsors in our category each year and still won, so they weren't bought awards. And we're the only company ever to have won in back to back years with the British Computer Society. We went in Specialist Vendor of the Year this year. Unfortunately, we were a finalist, but didn't win. So can't bring myself to put it on the slide. Um, however, this year, we're going to go into a security category. We feel we have a very strong story now around how we protect legacy server uh, infrastructure alongside client infrastructure as well. And this is the context of, of how we do um, what we do. Um, what we do is, is put these applications into our container, isolate them away, uh, and produce for our technology to work and executable for the different platforms that we support. And you, you can run once inside the droplet computing container um, any on any system pretty much, but Chrome, Windows 10, Linux, Mac, you'd have a DMG for Mac, for example, an executable for Windows 10, uh, a DMB, uh, a DEB file or an RPM file for Linux, et cetera. And we also support cloud versions as well. So we can run on multi-session like Windows Virtual Desktop or Citrix, um, as we, we've done on, on a few customers like BT that upgraded their Citrix farm from 4.5. Um, the applications won't run on the latest version of the Citrix farm. So therefore, they placed those applications into the droplet computing container, upgraded their Citrix farm, and then redeployed our container onto the latest Citrix to run via that system. Um, the main focus really for today and what we see within NHS will be the Windows 10 journey um, because of the, the deal that's done with Microsoft where you got uh, you guys have, uh, are free to upgrade on that Windows 10 journey. I think that's where the key focus for, for the demo today will be though. But it's nice to know your options for the future. We then attach our container 
cleaner technology that would have all your governance in, all of your security policies, all of what a user can and can't do, all get locked into the container image as well as the applications. And we run two types of, of container by default, a DCI-X, which takes care of the older runtimes like DOS, XP, et cetera, um, that may still persist within the healthcare environments. Um, and that could be uh, an expensive piece of machinery or a piece of equipment, a scanning device, for example, that, that's prevalent that we've done some work with an NHS trust on, uh, that sometimes a serial port connected to them or a USB connected to them. What we're able to do is put the software that natively only runs on that XP or Windows 7 uh, system into the container. We allow pass-through of the serial or the USB device to a Windows 10 system, and that would then secure that down to persist. So uh, avoiding an expensive purchase of a, of a very expensive machine just to stay compliant with security or in the worst case scenario and things that, that, that I absolutely hate where waiting lists are getting longer and, and you need this equipment to help patients, uh, but you can't bring it online because of the security implications that that would bring to the to the trust. This is a way in which for those machines to stay in service be compliant and be secure. So that's that's what we're looking for. And we don't just rely on us um, to say that we're secure. Um, we actually go out to third party. We're, we're frequently pen tested by our customers as well, but we go out to third party. So in the last round, we went out to the NCC group PLC and we put some horrible nasties inside our, our container. It was uh, an old uh, legacy application running on IE8, uh, running J Initiator with a, a Java 1.6 uh, applet that, that needed in there to run, so very exploitable. Um, obviously would fail on, on most uh, audits. Put those inside the container, run the, that particular system and said to the NCC group, go do your worst, go hack. We tried to hack first from the outside the, um, I'd say I stick to a Windows 10 instance in this case, so Windows 10 instance, and you have a patched and secured up to date Windows 10 system in the first instance protecting you. So we're an app to run an app, I like to say, and a wrapper inside that operating system. So first they need to get through that defense. Um, so the first port of call, tick in the box, they couldn't get through at all. But then we took the test a step further and we took a compromised host uh, and a Windows 10 machine and with all their tools in, and they tried to hack from a compromised host into the container and still couldn't gain access to anything that we were running with in turn inside and in the context of the container. We block all inbound ports, in fact. So I was talking earlier about the zero trust model. We have a zero anyone model. I liken it to um, if any of you got the Trend Micro system, for example, that, that does scanning of, of passing through. Now, the gate's still open in that scenario. And what's happening is you're checking people's security credentials as you're coming in uh, and you're lowering your drawbridge when you say, yeah, OK, you don't look suspicious. In you come, in you come. Obviously, that doesn't protect against that zero day uh, threat or attack with droplet because we don't allow anything in if your friend or foe we don't care you don't come in um, therefore where our drawbridge is up we have a moat around it we have the sharks and the crocodiles eating anything that comes inside it's a much hardened story for security it's a much better way to protect yourself not just today but going forward to the future as well um, we do run in in those virtual environments. I, I'm talking about the BT use case we have with Citrix. So if your journey is on any of these sort of virtual platforms or to get yourself to the cloud, whether that be in Azure or Amazon, and, and some of the, the holdbacks will be these legacy apps won't run within those environments. They do within the context of Droplet. So we can still persist those um, those legacy applications to be able to run in those um, in those environments for you quite happily. Um, or publish it as a single app via the cloud. So you have things like AppStream within Amazon's world, virtual apps within Citrix. Again, that can be achieved within a droplet container. Some of the key applications that we've seen, and there are many and varied across uh, the NHS, but some of these applications you you may be aware of or you may find within your trust you're, you're having a, a challenge with. And in some cases, um, similar to the use case I was talking about at the beginning, some of these uh, applications are available now on Windows 10. 
the challenge is there was no feature benefit, no particular reason for the trust to move forward. Um, but there was a large bill attached to that upgrade. Uh, and therefore, we've got use cases on the trust where we were able to significantly save them costs of that upgrade by putting the slightly older version of the I think it was chemo care um, was the application inside the container, allowing that to persist and work on a, a Windows 10 system um, without the need to pay for that expensive upgrade that gave them nothing more than Windows 10 compliance. What we have on the on the server side as well, because these legacy applications don't just have a, a dependency back to the client side, they also they're typically running back and talking back to a server back end. And that could be a 2003, 2008 server system and soon to go end of life server 2012, if you have any of those that persist. We take the same um, sort of zero trust model into the the server environment. And we have a, we can either run on existing VMware estates uh, within Azure, within AWS. Um, we have our, our bomb proof container sitting on that side that only our client side can access. We encrypt traffic between the two. So data in flight is also protected against the man in the middle attack. Um, and therefore, you're able to achieve and uh, and get certified for things like Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus, significantly reducing, if you're doing the DSP toolkit score, uh, significantly reducing that score as, as well. Um, so with within this sort of scenario, you're protecting the legacy client access on the, on the client side, on the device of choice. That then gets encrypted traffic and on the server side all that from an audit point of view they see are modern operating systems either the modern windows 10 it be in your cases on the um, on the client side and in the server side we actually deploy a, a, an appliance a virtual appliance that sits on a, a modern linux host so that would be all that an auditor would see on on that side never being able to see what's going on inside our container and our secret source that sits on that linux host that then contains your Windows servers 2003, 2008, um, with the client access set up between the two. M Michelle will demonstrate that for you um, as we go forward. Now, as I was saying earlier, we can persist these particular th uh, server containers on either VMware, Azure, we do AWS now as well, or bare metal. So really you have that freedom of choice. What we see in the main is VMware, dominates and most people have a VMware estate and we just uh, import an OVF and a virtual appliance into that uh, world to get Droplet up and running. We do a lift and shift model of existing um, configuration on the server. We can do it that you start from a bare base image and you build your, your software back in. But to be honest, 100% of our customers do a lift and shift where we take a known good configuration of the server, lift and shift that into the modern world um and take that across so everything just works as it did today but in a secure manner and with that i'm gonna ask uh, sam if uh, if he could hand over to michelle now who's going to take you through a demonstration of this uh droplet stuff working thanks very much barry uh michelle you should be good to present your screen when you're ready great can you see my screen now Can you see my screen? Uh, yep, we're good. Yep, yep, we're good. Perfect. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a, a Windows 10 uh, based system, and I've got our container up and running. Uh, for the most part, end users don't actually interact directly with this um, interface, although they can use it to launch applications. In the main, the container sits in the system tray down the bottom here, um, discreetly waiting for end users to connect. Um, so for the main, users start their containerized applications from double-clicking a shortcut on their desktop, like I've just done there, to launch a legacy version of Excel. Obviously, in the context of uh, the NHS and, and other companies, it's usually not a shrink wrap application like Excel that's being 
used within the system. It's usually something that is critical to your particular organization or even specifically to the, the trust. As you can see, though, when the user runs the application, they really have no awareness that this is running inside a containerized environment. So the application floats on the end user's screen, looks like it's running natively on Windows 10, but it's actually running inside the container itself. We may maintain a complete isolation of the container from the Windows 10 environment. So as Barry was saying, it's then possible to ingest and apply Windows 10 security updates and patches without any fear that it's going to clobber or break the delicate configuration of your particular applications. So it's especially useful for people who've got a single machine with lots of different apps installed and you want those uh, end users to be able to use those applications, whatever happens in terms of pushing out updates. We do have a number of security settings that are worth uh, looking at because we talked about securing legacy applications. So the UI itself is um, read-only until the administrator unlocks the container. The primary reason for unlocking the container would be to uh, install new software or additional software. Under the actual settings of the container itself, we do have our own firewall. Now, although you can't see it, around the entire firewall, around the entire software, rather, there is a firewall which blocks all inbound communication. No SDK or API exists for anybody to change that setting. It's encoded into our uh, executable. So that means that SDK or API can't be misused by a hacker, for example. For applications that don't need any outbound network access, for example, you can actually uh, close the outbound access as well. Now, our default is that we allow traffic to flow out of the container onto the network if it's initiated by the client. But if you had an application where all that particular PC was doing was managing a scanner, for argument's sake, then you could actually block all outbound communication. We also support joining the container to a domain, uh, to an active directory domain, so you can bolt it down additionally with policies that way. Alternatively, if you leave it in its default workgroup mode, you still have access to things like Microsoft's policy settings, which allow you to impose further GPO-like restrictions on the actual contain container itself. So we haven't removed or broken or changed anything about the Windows security model. We've merely created a shell around that to protect the system as well as blocking uh, communication in and out of the software. One common task that people have is to install software into the container. And the easiest way to do that is actually to copy your software to the container, usually through the network, although there are other ways. And then all you have to do is run the installation inside the context of the Explorer that we provide for the container itself. So you can install as many applications to the container as you wish. And there's no special sequencing or recording process to managing a droplet container. You merely install your software into the container as if it was a, a standard Windows machine. And that software will run, load up, without really any post configuration tasks, except the ones that you would normally do if you need to customize the settings. All that's really left for me to do as the administrator in this particular case, though, is to give a shortcut to that particular application. So this is, if you like, our kind of publishing front end. There are many hundreds, if not thousands, of executables inside the container. But in this case, as the administrator, I'm only allowing access to a limited set of applications for the end user. In terms of deploying our software, we're just an MSI file. We're less than 100 megabytes in size, so a very light footprint in terms of the software. And it's really just a bunch of files that are used to create this, this environment in which the application can, can run. And because it's just a bunch of files, it means transporting and deploying the, the software is very, very easy. You can use things like Intune or System Center Configuration Manager or even just scripts to automate the install, copying files to the machine and copying files to the user's user profile is all that we really require. 
One common use of our software and a common use case that we come up with the NHS is when you need access to external devices. So let me switch to a different system where I've got a version of our software set up that is USB based. So we do support USB and COM port redirection in our product. The USB edition of our software allows you to capture any USB devices on the physical machine. Even if Windows 10 doesn't have a driver, it merely has to enumerate the device name and its identity. And then you can start using that USB device inside the container. Now, we have a number of NHS trusts using this, mainly when they have expensive scanners. And those scanners are still worthwhile. They still function perfectly fine. They still have medical value uh, within the organization. But the software that was running on that was either Windows XP based or Windows 7 based and simply won't run on Windows 10. It doesn't really make any economic sense to have to upgrade the scanner or wherever the medical appliance is simply because of a change in software. Once the um, system is connected, we can actually launch that scanner. Again, the application, wherever it might be, is just presented on screen, just like it was when they were using Windows 7 or Windows XP. The user just clicks scan or carries out whatever the, the task is and the system will spin up, scan the document or scan the X-ray or whatever it might be. And then the user can carry on in the part of their workflow, which allows them to you know, analyze that or maybe submit that to a member of staff for further analysis. So we do support USB based connected devices, which is very common in our environment. And we also support COM ports and serial devices. So if I switch back to my other desktop here, I do have um, a device connected to this system which is just using a COM port to communicate from the machine to the device. And once I've uh, woken that system up and logged into it, I'll be able to interact with that system and manage it. Uh, I must admit, this perhaps comes up more commonly in engineering environments where we've got people carrying out maintenance tasks with various systems and they are using the serial or LPT port functions. Another use of these external device uh, options are things like licensing dongles, uh, where the license is on a serial device or the license is on a USB dongle of some description. So that's the client side. I've just got time to speak about our server based container. So um, this came out naturally from our discussions with customers where they were wanting to uh, containerize a legacy application. But what was happening is that legacy application was speaking to a legacy based server back end. So um, what I've got here is a droplet server container running on one of our appliances running uh, 2003 as an example. Of course, we do support 2008 as well and also 2012. We occasionally come up against uh, requirements for Linux and rarely come up for requirements for things like Windows 2000 and NT4. At the moment, it seems to be 2008, which is the, the pain point. So we can persist these legacy uh, server operating systems, and we can lift and shift them, as Barry said, from their physical or virtual environment into the container. Where this appliance runs is really up to you guys. Uh, in my case, I've got a three node ESX cluster. So I'm running this on premises on my internal lab here. And I've got three copies of the appliance, which equates to my three different containers. From an external auditor's perspective, what they're going to see is a modern Linux can, uh, uh, kernel. We support Red Hat, we support uh, CentOS, Fiodora, different distributions of Debian. They're simply not going to see the legacy system that's running inside that particular container. You can conceptualize this as adding a layer above the hypervisor, above the virtual machine, a bit like with VMware's NSX product, where they do that for networking. We're adding this layer of abstraction for additional security and also means that you can leverage your investment on your on-premises infrastructure. The appliance is wired to the, the network which is how we create some of our separation. And we have the capacity to set up our own network layers on the actual appliance itself. 
as well as being able to set up uh, access for storage. So the actual containers can be stored externally on NFS or on iSCSI based targets. So we have lots of infrastructure options that will keep your infrastructure people happy. How does the client component fit to this? Well, if I switch back to my legacy environment, I've got a shortcut here, which is an IE. <clears throat> and this client is trying to connect to one of those server containers you saw a moment ago, and it's failing. The reason it's failing is I first need to connect to what we call the droplet secure network. Yeah. So you can conceptualize this a bit like a VPN where the user has to provide a username and password and connect to that secure layer. Once connected to that secure layer, they can then use those shortcuts that we've created inside our container to again get to their application. So in this case, I'm a very simple uh, demonstration, but it just illustrate both ends of the equation. I've got a very old uh, copy of IE version 8 running inside the container. And the only thing that's allowing it to connect to the server container that you saw a moment ago is the secure gateway that we have bedded into our product. And what we're doing here effectively is creating a secure bubble, not just over the client uh, application, but a secure bubble around the legacy server application and creating an encrypted bubble. So any data in flight that is taking place between the client and the server is encrypted. So think about that for a second. Normally, these sorts of access gateways would be used to allow people access from untrusted networks like the Internet. What we've done is taken that principle into the corporate network. What we're actually saying is the corporate network can't be trusted either. Um, so we're overlaying a layer of security on top of that corporate network, which is normally trusted by most people, and saying we can't, in this particular case, completely trust that, that particular network path. By doing that, in some respects, the security around uh, a containerized application is actually greater than a standard application listening on port 80 or 443 wired directly to the network. Only once the end user has our software, only if they've got a valid username and password to connect to the gateway, can they launch the legacy application. And that should protect it from external intrusion by third parties who may try and capture unsecure or unencrypted traffic between the clients and have to capture passwords and, and other sensitive bits of data. So just to summarize, um, we introduce a compatibility layer either on the client side or on the server side. That compatibility layer gives us a great deal of isolation between the legacy environment and the modern OS. Of course, the modern OS, or in the case of the server product, the hypervisor, is the first barrier that stops anybody getting into it. As Barry said, we're an app to run an app, so we're very lightweight in terms of the application, less than 100 meg. And by adding that compatibility layer to a series of security functions, we're able to get that legacy application to persist on the network beyond its natural lifetime or beyond any other method of making it function, to some degree perhaps being more secure than you know any modern-based application. With that, I would like to hand back to Barry and the main presenters to deal with any questions. I'll keep sharing my screen in case any of the questions are facilitated by me, sort of just showing it on screen. Barry, back to you. I was going to say to Sam, Sam, is there a chat yeah. facility there? Uh, yes, I've got a couple of questions uh, that have come in. Obviously, if anybody's got any questions, please um, put them in the Q&A box now, and we'll get to those once we've answered the ones we've already got. Um, so the first one is, how much of the operating system is reflected in your container? For example, an application needs XP. How much of XP is actually running in the container? That's a very good question. Um, we do have different generations of containers. The DCI-X is probably our oldest container that's designed for running DOS and Windows XP and 9X Apple applications. We do strip out a lot of the, for want of a better word, guff that's simply not needed, although we have to be quite careful when we do that because everybody's applications are unique. Um, Microsoft recognizes that over 
60,000 XP applications and Windows 7 applications still in use today. And of course, that's an awful lot of applications for us to test against, and we can't test against all of them. So we do strip down mainly for performance, but also for security. We will remove things that we think uh, present a security threat. If somebody got inside the container, what we hope is that they don't even get that far. But I, I would say it's a very thin, light environment that's presented to the application whilst maintaining the application dependencies like the need for .NET or the need for Java or, God forbid, the need for ActiveX controls. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, does the gateway use AD credentials? Yes, it does. In my case, I've not joined the DSG to the Croplet Secure Gateway to the domain, uh, but I could easily do that and use domain credentials. We actually offer two different flavors of the DSG. We offer a Windows-based version and a Linux version. Um, a lot of our customers tend to opt for the Windows version for the kind of AD authentication, but also there are some unique things really coming through from Microsoft in the world of authentication. And I think they've got a little bit of a lead on some of the other vendors at the moment. Fantastic. Uh, next question is, um, does copy and paste work between the applications in the container and the host OS? Most definitely. Um, one thing I would say about that is we do have a control over that. So in my case, I have allowed copy and paste. And that means if I run some other application, like I run Notepad Native on the, on the Windows 10 system, I just select that and copy it. I can then paste it over. We do have controls on these sorts of functions because we want to provide uh, an isolated layer, but the downside of that is do you then upset the functionality of various applications? So just to show you very quickly, we have a number of different redirects. The second one you can see here is clipboard equals true. Usually these are set to false. So we take a security posture of all the doors are closed until the administrator decides to open them. Some customers, some organizations see copy and paste as a potential security weakness. But in, in the days of print screen and people having phones on them, it's actually very easy to get data out of an organization by other methods these days. But we do do other redirects as well, like redirecting printers, redirecting drives, redirecting COM ports, which I've shown a moment ago, and redirecting audio. So, I mean, a good example of redirect audio is when you have a consultant uh, recording their interpretation of an x-ray, for example, and then somebody has to come along and type that up as patient notes and patient records. So there's a written record of what was what was said. So, you know, the audio can be sometimes quite useful in a, a medical context. But uh, yeah, the short answer is, yes, we can do copy and paste. And you can turn it off and turn it on depending on what you think the user should have access to. Okay. Uh, next question is: Can you take a piece of software that only runs on a 32-bit operating system, and um, if it's in a container, run it on a 64-bit operating system host? Yes. In fact, that's what I'm doing here. Um, the container I've got running at the moment is. Uh, a DCI M732, the 32 indicates that it's 32-bit, but the version of Windows that I'm using is 64-bit. Uh, if I scroll down here somewhere, it'll probably say 64-bit somewhere. Can't remember where you actually see that now. It is 64-bit. I just can't seem to find where it is. But yes, most, uh, most definitely. Great. Um, um, in fact, in fact, the Ascribe application that that question mentioned is is uh, an application we've come across before. Uh, I think NHS Tayside are running Ascribe inside a droplet container. Thanks, Barry. Um, another question is, how do you back up um, applications that you've got within your containers? There are a number of options. Um, what many of our customers do is they run a backup agent inside the container and do it that way. Remember, it's a flat image file that we present. And for the most part, um, people just see us as a, a way of delivering the application. And by hook or by crook, store the data outside of the container. So there isn't anything to backup as such. So if I just launch uh, one of these uh, 
containerized apps, let me just show you the different kind of save options that you've got. So if I went to save here, I could store on the local drive of the container. This particular machine has got our redirects enabled, which is allowing me to get to my profile location to then save on the physical PC. So what we normally say to customers is, if you have to, by all means store data on the container, but in the main, we would store that data outside on the network or on the local machine. Uh, we could also store on OneDrive and other places like that, although that's not always available. So if you needed to do a backup, then certainly, yes, we would support that. But we try and treat the uh, container as just an, an engine for running applications and separate the data from the actual container itself. Okay, uh, I've got a couple more questions to get through. Um, is there an enterprise console to manage the endpoints? That's a really good question. Um, and what I normally say to customers is Droplet doesn't introduce yet another single pane of glass or another management console that has to be patched, maintained, and upgraded as you move from one version to another. So we're very much about the runtime and very much around improving the features and functionalities of the container. When a customer says, okay, we've bought into you and we'd like to deploy your software, how do we do that? The first question that me and Barry will ask them is, how do you do that currently? So um, do they have uh, SCCM? Do they use uh, Mobile Iron? Do they use Intune? And what we do is we work with the deployment team to work out a project plan and a process by which they can just leverage their existing management uh, interfaces to deploy the software and, and, and manage it that way. Okay, thank you. Final question is, how does Droplet differ from uh, Microsoft App V? I think there's a big difference to be said, and maybe Barry, you can chip in here after I've finished. App, App V is very much a kind of packaging process um, where you substantially change the operating environment in which the application previously ran. App V still has quite close dependencies with the underlying Windows OS, and there has been uh, stories of upgrades of Windows 10 kind of breaking those apps. We're much, much more isolated. We're more closer to a virtual machine and its level of isolation than, say, a, a packaging system like, I don't know, AppV or ThinApp or something like it. We do occasionally come across customers who've got such a strong affiliation with AppV that paradoxically, they actually run AppV inside the container. We've had that a couple of times. And sometimes that happens because they've invested quite heavily in AppV or they no longer know how to know how to install those apps natively because AppV or something like it has been around in that system for a while. So we sometimes slipstream behind that commitment to AppV. Um, but in most cases, it, it, people are looking for some kind of of replacement. But I think what I would say is that there's a high degree of isolation um, from the underlying physical OS to our container. Did, did you want to add anything to that, Barry? Yeah, yeah security um, is the main difference for me. And we've described in detail how we isolate, block all the doors coming in. If your ones and zeros of your app are vulnerable, AppV will do nothing to protect that whatsoever. Um, you'll still be open on your network allowing that vulnerability to be exposed via the application to the host system by isolating away, by closing all the doors, uh, blocking access to anything, getting to that application and its vulnerability. Um, we harden significantly um, the security story around that. The BA was the, the highest profile one on the use case that Michelle spoke about where Terminal 5 went down to summers ago. They packaged their legacy app into AppV. There was eight, uh, no, 1909 came out with a, a big um, security stack on the network. They tested it in their labs. It worked fine. The app seemed to work fine. As soon as they put it live and deployed it, um, the network piece of the application stopped talking to each other, um, which they couldn't test until they put it into a live environment because 
at V still had dependencies back on the network a stack within the host operating system. That's what broke because everything moved and changed. You'd have to go through repackaging process. It's expensive. It's far more expensive, far more difficult. DLL hell is a, a, an issue, certainly with connected devices, getting all the right dependencies together in an app capturing process. We have none of that complication whatsoever in, in, within our technology. Hopefully that finishes and frames that, that question and answers it appropriately. Yep, thank you, Barry. Um, question here, we've got Virtual Server Windows 2000 um, with third-party legacy software installed. This talks to legacy Windows XP clients. Will the clients need any software installed? So um, there's a couple of uh, things there. Um, with a system that, that that is that old, I, I imagine we would need both um, our client side and server side container first to take the existing virtual machines and convert them to the appropriate format to run on Droplet server. Of course, the physical machines would run, say, something like Windows 10. Um, one thing to mention about, the, say, the Windows XP example is we do occasionally come across some customers who have lost or don't have or cannot find or simply are unable to access the original media. So in, in those situations, we can not just lift and shift the server OS, we can also lift and shift the client OS and put that inside a container. Um, and, and that can sometimes alleviate that issue of compatibility of different layers. What I would say is, is that, that that particular use case probably needs a bit more detail, a bit more information about how those various components fit together to give a more detailed technical answer. But that that's probably the best I can say, given the volume of info I've got. Yeah, OK. Thanks, Michelle. Um, that's a great point. Dave will be um, following up with uh, anyone that's asked a question um, post-session anyway, so we can go into a bit more detail um, in that question and, and find out yeah, more information for you. Um, I think we've got one final question to end the session with, which is um, if you can save to local disk um, or there's access to local disk, how do you stop um, any attacks coming from that vector? Um, well, first of all, access to this sort of um, drive letters that I was showing before is a policy setting. And it was merely because I had that policy switched on that you were seeing the drive letters. If I turned off that policy setting, then the drive letters that you were seeing, probably not a good example of this machine, but the other one actually, let me just bring it back. Those those drive letters just wouldn't be there. In terms of the drive letter associated with the actual container, the C drive of the container, I would use a Microsoft policy to hide that. So um, I might have shown you earlier the the GP, GP edit, or if it was attached to the domain, a domain policy to hide that C drive. It's a very common policy. So I could, if I wanted to, hide all of these drive letters using various settings and policies. I just haven't had them turned on. And that would just show Mac network drives and nothing else. Yeah. We do occasionally have customers who say we don't allow any SMB or SIFS Microsoft sharing on the network. And so for that reason, we also have another means, which I've not talked about yet, which is a replication process that we have between the container and the physical machine, such as when files are created in the container and stored in the shared location, they get replicated to the physical machine. Uh, so we've developed this particular technology mainly for the banking and finance sector where they work in air-gapped environments where there is no network-based storage and they don't want to be able to have any sort of redirects or any of that sort of stuff. Everything is shut down, but they still paradoxically need to get data in and out of the system. So if all the doors are closed, we've got another method of getting data in and out. But we, we tend to deal with that particular issue on a case-by-case -case basis to try and find out you know, what, are the, what are the end users are used to doing and try and make the experience inside the container match as closely as possible that user experience. Michelle.
Could you also just show the outbound firewall rules? Because I think that's also applicable to that question in that once you know where your app needs to talk to, you can lock everything else down. Sure. So um, as Barry was saying, and I touched on this briefly, this, this firewall doesn't just allow or block. We can block everything and then say we only allow access to X, Y, and Z based on IP address and protocol. So the example I gave earlier in the demo where I was using a web browser to connect to a server container, I know its IP address and I know what ports it's listening on. I could actually make it such the application, all it can do is run that legacy web browser and all it can connect, connect, connect to is that backend server. So there are lots of additional settings, options, and tools that we can use to close doors, hide, hide doors. And of course, it's always a compromise. Uh, closed doors, you remove functionality, but you make it more secure. Open doors, you, know, you increase functionality, but you open your attack surface. So it's always a question of whereabouts on that uh, line of configuration, how hard do you want to tighten the screws in terms of security, but still keep the application and the user productive. Okay, oh. and, when, and when you consider these apps have to persist, um, and you consider your alternatives for delivering these apps, I think Droplet offers a far more secure way to um, to do that. Right, um, that concludes uh, the questions. Thank you very much to the audience for some fantastic questions there. Thank you very much. Uh, Barry and Michelle for a great presentation. Thanks to Dave. Dave, if you've got any follow-up questions, please direct them um, to Dave and, and he can make sure that they get answered. Similarly, if you want to um, schedule uh, a one-to-one -one demo um, to, to look at anything in more detail, please reach out to Dave. Obviously, if you've got any commercial questions as well, he can help you with that respect. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone, everyone for your time. And uh, I hope to see you again on an uh, Open Reality webinar soon. Thank you for all the questions. They were really great. Yeah, no, excellent. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye.